So we enter from flatworms, we go into the realm of roundworms. And so another phylum that has been updated from the old Ascolindes. Uh, these are phylum nematoda, or nematodes as they're commonly referred to. Um, also fairly large, fairly long. Um, most of the uh, groups that we're really interested in here look or resemble your classic worm that everybody's familiar with, except that the ones that we're interested in kind of observing um, usually have some sort of, again, uh, medical or socioeconomical effect behind them. So uh, most of these, in this case, kind of are fairly long and cylindrical and tube-like, so very, very uh, recognizable as a worm, if you will, right? And so uh, they have all these variations in terms of their life cycles, but there are some very common ones behind them that you should be familiar with. Uh, pretty much that their eggs have to be consumed, um, and that means whether by drinking it or eating it. And then normally what happens is that the uh, hatchlings, the little larvae, um, either will kind of start swimming around inside of you until they find their final place of reproduction, or if they're outside of you, they will be looking for pieces of your skin or a wound to get again inside of you and then try and find a place to reproduce. Now again, very similar to our uh, flatworms that we saw before, sometimes these guys can insist also and form little calcium over calcifications, sorry. And then at that point in time, they can actually cause damage, uh, dead tissue and so on and so forth. Now this typically only happens when people end up consuming uh, poorly cooked or undercooked food uh, or eating it flat out raw. So you'll see some of the examples in a moment. And there's a couple of them out there that are transmitted through some sort of vector like a mosquito. And I'll show you the last one in there under this kind of case. So let's deal with our first one, which we'll also deal with in the lab. Um, its name is Ascaris lumbricoides, uh, which causes this wonderful little disease called ascariasis, right? Um, and I'm already kind of providing what the awesomeness behind it, as well as this life cycle, which is really what you want to know, right? Is that pretty much you can find this everywhere. Uh, again, poor areas, poor sanitation, rural areas, that kind of thing. Um, and just kind of again, so if at the scale of this guy, this hits about a billion people on the planet every year. So that's one in seven to one in eight people on the planet. So I understand how crazy this gets, right? Um, now, normally this is kind of consumed by uh, via water or something that you're washing with, things like vegetables most of the time. And so what happens is that once you consume them, they usually make it to your small intestine. And what's crazy about this is that it doesn't stay in your intestines. Instead, it kind of pokes through little holes and enters your circulation, so your veins and your arteries so it can make it into your lungs and so what happens is it kind of stays inside your lungs uh, reproducing a little bit and then it perforates a hole and makes it into your pharynx your windpipe for those of you familiar with that one right and then it'll pass through so that it can reach uh, into there so you can swallow it if you will and then eventually makes it to your intestine again and so it kind of uh, goes through this cycle as it reproduces and so each time you know, producing several hundred thousand eggs on a daily basis and kind of going through this. Now, very similar to our tapeworms and what we had asked earlier, uh, most people can't really feel this. Uh, so they're kind of largely asymptomatic. The only time people end up finding out that they have these guys is because of what we call the burden. So that distension that occurs in that kind of lower gut area, so in your intestines in this case, simply because of a huge amount of these guys kind of growing and then ultimately uh, distending the, the colon, the intestines, and sometimes rupturing it, or if not, the most common case is constipation. So uh, the uh, intestines are obstructed, they can't go to the bathroom, and they go, all right, well, let's go check a doctor kind of thing. Again, one of the issues here is that because it's common in rural and poor areas, their access to medicine and healthcare is also very poor. Now, the way you figure this out, is um, through the eggs fecally. So that means you figure out what the eggs look like and then um, you can diagnose them that way. Uh, sometimes because you kind of develop this kind of uh, weird cough associated with it because they're messing with your lungs, 
Um, you can actually measure it uh, in the sputum. But probably the one that you're seeing there, and I assume you're noticing, is that every now and then, while you're sleeping, they can come out. And so, um, as they're trying to get either access to something, sometimes whether it's extra amounts of oxygen or certain nutrients, or the burden can get so heavy that they're trying to find a way out, they will crawl out of you. And that means they will go through your intestines uh, one way or the other. So they can eventually re, uh, reach your uh, nose and your mouth, although again, relatively rare. Now again, most of this is largely asymptomatic, so you don't really feel it in any way, shape, or form, even while they're passing from one uh, organ to another. So they're pretty good at hiding. Um, these also can be uh, relatively easily treated with uh, anti-helminthic drugs. So albendazole is one of the ones I have been mentioning before. There's a couple of other ones. And when in the event that the uh, worm burden is so large, that in this case, the, even the obstruction becomes a danger to the host, then surgery becomes the uh, final stage. Now I will tell you, just in a way to kind of traumatize you a little bit, that when the worm burden is so high, and then you treat them with these anti-helminthics, what ends up happening is this wonderful kind of feast of dead worms kind of falling nearly out of you at a rate that you've never seen before come out of you. So all the worms happen to die at the same time, and now they have to fall out. And so you get this clearing range of just worms passing through you very, very fast. Kind of a disgusting uh, scenario right there. Now, relatively preventable. Uh, clean water, boiling things, that kind of thing are the ways to do that. But again, it's not necessarily always accessible. All right. Uh, probably one of my favorites, and unfortunately also one of the ones that gets misused all the time, um, are my hookworms. And interestingly enough about them, uh, there's two of them that I'll mention kind of side by side, which are Ankylostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus. And Nicator will get to play with that in the lab. But what happens here is that they have these really kind of cool looking faces, if you will, and they kind of pop up on memes all the time. And unfortunately, they get mistaken for bacteria. I'm like, that's not really the look of a bacterium, first of all. But especially when people are talking about antibiotic resistance, I'm sure you've probably seen memes like that. Now, the reason why is because they're relatively kind of scary. And what they have is on their mouths, okay, what you're seeing in there, are some sort of way to um, hook themselves or grab themselves onto something so that they don't fall off. And some of them can use part of those mouths um, as a way to kind of cut through you and enter you um, to get access to your bloodstream. So um, to get again, I guess scale of behind these guys is that these hit about a little bit more than half a billion people a year. So again, a very large scale behind them. And you pretty much find them everywhere in the world. Uh, you find mostly uh, Ankylostoma in our area, and you uh, find Nicator kind of in the southern portion sometimes, a little bit more often than not. It, again, it's fairly well distributed. Um, same premise in terms of what they do. They kind of poke holes through you, enter the circulation, enter your lungs, pass through the pharynx and through the esophagus, and then make it to the intestines. And in the intestines, that's usually kind of where they get it on. They mate. Uh, and then they mature, get eggs, and those eggs get passed in through the feces. Now the problem with these guys is again, they're kind of eating you whole. So not holes in this case, but whole, meaning that these are consuming the tissue that is around them. And at this point in time, they can cause some severe uh, nutrition deficiencies from anything from just protein to all the way to your blood. So it can get rather heavy in terms of the damage that they do. But again, easily treated and sanitation goes a long way. Now, behind them though, let me kind of expand a little bit more behind them. Um, you can diagnose them based on just kind of their shape, they look, they're fairly easy, and by those cool little teeth that you see in their mouth, those little hooks associated with them. That's one of the easiest ways to kind of diagnose them, just by shape in this case. Now, so what normally will happen is the eggs that, you know, happen to be produced while they were mating inside of your intestines. 
what will happen is they'll turn into this little youngling called a repetitiform larva, or a larva, if you will. And that guy will just kind of grow outside of you. It'll kind of hatch, it'll grow, it'll develop, it'll turn into its teenage years, if you will. And then it will turn into the kind of violent version of them, in this case, the teenager, uh, late adult that is seeking to take over the world called the filariform larvae. And that one will literally seek you out. So it's an active worm trying to get inside of you. And more common than not, as you saw in the previous image, is that um, it seeks kind of cuts and holes inside your skin. And more often than not, this happens to your feet, especially because you're walking over things like grass. And so grass, for those of you familiar with it, obviously, um, is sharp. It actually causes many little cuts on your skin. So walking barefoot over your grass actually uh, increases your chances. So shoes are a good thing in this case. That these little uh, uh, angry forms called the uh, filariform uh, larvae will look for you and penetrate your skin, will cut little pieces of your skin and enter unless you already have a wound and they'll enter through there. And then at that point in time, uh, they'll make it to your uh, circulation system, they'll make it to your lungs, your uh, windpipe, back to the esophagus, stomach, which will swallow it, um, technically not digest it, make it to your uh, lower intestine, sorry, smaller intestine, I'm sorry about that, in which they'll then again reproduce and repeat the cycle. Now, what's crazy about this is how long it takes because the uh, cycle of Nicator, for example, can be up to uh, anywhere between a year to several years while it's doing this. Whereas uh, ankylostoma, on the other hand, is a little bit faster, it takes about half a year to do so. So kind of neat. Now, one of the ones we don't really get to see in the lab, but is also a very entertaining one, is called a pinworm. And so the guy that you're seeing here is called Enterobius vermicularis, um, also hitting roughly about I have a billion people on the planet, and this one does pop up in the United States quite often. Um, for those of you who are familiar with, our population is about 330, 340 million in the United States. This guy hits about 10% of us. So now, um, what's the cool thing about this guy is that they like humans, although there are versions for dogs and other versions out there. Now, what you're seeing here is as graphic as can get, not for gratuitous purposes, but just kind of to explain to you how this actually works, is that um, what normally happens is that they mate inside of you, right? They are inside your intestines. And what will happen is that once the uh, female versions of these uh, become pregnant or gravid, if you will, they will actually migrate. They will travel to the outside. So that means they'll exit uh, through the anus and lay eggs there. And so what happens is that these eggs happen to need the extra little bit amount of oxygen in there. And so they'll kind of hatch in the uh, perianal area. And then as they turn into little baby worms, they'll all crawl back in. So they'll kind of use that exit area as an import, if you will. Now, most of the time, these are largely asymptomatic with one small symptom that everybody feels, which is itching. So in this case, uh, one of the more common things, especially for those of your parents, uh, very likely if you've ever seen a child scratch their butt so hard that it looks like they're going to faint, it's likely that it's this guy. Um, so what happens is those eggs kind of hatching and crawling uh, back in, that's what they're doing. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that you can actually see this when, they're happen uh, when it's happening. And one of the most common things, and this is kind of an old version all this an old world version of this is that parents that knew that their children were infected um, would wait for their children to go to sleep. And while they were asleep, they would come in with a little flashlight and some tape or some cellophane and kind of blot uh, the child's anus in this case so they can remove all the little worms trying to crawl by, back in, right? And so this is kind of a very old world solution to prevent a, a higher worm burden. So. Believe it or not, this is not a joke. Um, this kind of association with these little worms kind of crawling back in is known as itchy butt syndrome. That's not a joke, people, okay? So in any case, uh, these tiny little pinworms, again, they go inside, mate, and do it all over and over. So unless it's treated, which we have definitely lots of cool anti-elementary drugs for them, uh, commonly accessible, 
relatively uh, easily diagnosable as well as treatable. Now, uh, the uh, prevention here, again, cleanliness is more than anything else, but also preventing the scratching part, right? So by preventing the scratching, which usually ends up shoving these guys back in, it's kind of preventing people from scratching themselves all along. So fun part, we don't play with these in the lab, unfortunately. Um, and one of the other ones that is kind of infamous over here, which is also another big deal, especially in our southern portions of our planet, um, this is very common in tropical areas too, uh, is Vukereria bancrofti. So yes, there are some uh, enunciation differences there. And um, these are known as filarial worms and cause this wonderful little disease called filariasis. Now, it has a common name called elephantiasis. Now be careful, this is not elephantitis, which is also a different uh, a disease. So be careful in how we enunciate that one too. Now, uh, commonly found in most of our southern areas from South America to South Africa and all the Southeast uh, Asian countries uh, and the continent itself is one wonderful little disease that is transmitted through mosquitoes, tropical mosquitoes, right? And so this guy carries the, um, the worm in this case, and it will transmit to you by biting. Now, what's really very unique about this guy, which is probably one of my favorite things about these guys too, is that the way that it uh, gets transmitted to you is by the mosquito when it goes and bites you, and it's obviously looking for a vein or anything else, it enters your circulation. Now, what happens there is that while it's kind of having its blood meal, part of that gets passed on to you. And so once that uh, bucaria gets inside of you, then it starts growing and crazy, but it likes one particular area. It loves your lymph nodes. And so what will normally happen is that it will kind of exit the circulation, exit the veins and arteries, and get into the lymphatic vessels, the lymphatic tubes, right? And then where it will happen is that it will kind of travel throughout your body until it finds a happy point that most of you are familiar with as your lymph nodes. Now, what's crazy about that is that they'll reproduce, they'll grow and grow and grow, but the issue there is that they clog the lymph node. They're large enough that they'll prevent filtration. And for those who are familiar with your uh, lymphatic system, lymphatic systems are designed to filter stuff, to clean stuff, right? And so if you obstruct the cleaning area, you obstruct the filter, then fluid accumulates, just like having a clogged sink, if you will, right? And so what will happen then is that the lymph fluid, the water that is mostly composed out of, will start seeping out. And so that means that out of the lymph nodes, you'll get these clogged lymph nodes with water or edema uh, start occurring in terms of uh, excess fluid accumulating outside your vessels. And so this is where the concept of phlebriasis or elephantiasis really occurs, is these very enlarged um, extremities, sort of arms and legs, typically the legs are hit first, um, in which the fluid just accumulates over years. And what's interesting about it is that, again, because it hits you, most of these areas that are usually uh, socioeconomically challenged, is that uh, people don't do anything about it. And there's really nothing you can do short of excising um, or cutting out, if you will, a uh, lymph node, which doesn't usually happen. We need those a lot. These just kind of grow. Sadly, again, extremely easily treatable. This does require a, a, uh, require, sorry, a slightly uh, different drug, not the azoles. This is something called diethylcarbamazine, uh, which does the same trick, pretty much kills these all. But at this point in time, the damage to the tissue is pretty much permanent. Um, and so what happens here is unless surgery is involved to kind of remove excess tissue and swelling and draining the fluid, that's pretty much the final look of them. So um, normally when these guys hit you, um, because they're entering the circulation, your immune system does try and fight it. And so this does usually carry the general malaise of flu-like symptoms. So that means lots of fevers, uh, lots of pains and so on and so forth. Now, here's the unique part. Here's the part that I find very, very cool. See, there's gotta be a way to transmit them. How do we transmit this little mosquito that is hiding inside your lymph nodes or in your blood vessels? Well, here's the really neat thing. Believe it or not, 
the worm has a circadian rhythm. In other words, it's aware of what night and day are. So what it does is that during the day, this worm will just hang out in the lymph nodes or in the fluid, just doing its thing, eating, reproducing. But at night, it will enter the circulation again, so it flows through your veins and arteries, so that when the mosquito feeding habits are, which are usually at night, it'll bite, it'll absorb it, and it'll take the eggs again. So it has this really, really neat coordinating job of kind of flowing out at night so that it can get picked up and transferred everywhere else. So I think that that's a really neat concept. I don't know about you guys. All right. So um, the last little group that we're going to look at over here of our round guys uh, is trichinella, which causes this wonderful little disease called trichinosis, right? And this is commonly known as pork worm or fred worm is the other term you'll see there. Um, in which same idea, uh, the next time you're consuming bacon, this will remind you a little bit of what's going on over there, right? Poorly cooked bacon, mind you. Um, in which this wonderful little nematode um, kind of hangs out in your intestine as well, um, but it will usually kind of excise itself to leave uh, the intestine and usually kind of get stuck in the muscle. But this one does it on purpose. So uh, it does kind of leave it so that it can get stuck in the muscle so that when you consume it, you get it. That's pretty much uh, the short and dirty version of that guy. Again, cleanliness, better cooking, and decent drugs are avail uh, available out there to kind of take care of you. Nothing to worry about too much. So now, there's one last group that I really wanted to kind of add here, which is uh, phylum and but this one is not all about anything behind uh, diseases. This is just kind of fun. And so you'll notice that it wasn't highlighted in the original group. Uh, Phylomonellida has under its subclassifications one specific uh, class called Aelosomata and one subclass, so a different taxon over here, called Herodinia. Now, the reason why I bring this guy up is because of my kind of favorite story associated with this the use of leeches. Now, under your segmented worms, these are all your classic worms that everybody's familiar with, right? So they look like little worms, so do leeches. But here, aside from the fact that leeches consume blood, which you're all familiar with, it's really the concept of using it for the benefit of it. And the reason behind it is that we've been using leeches to treat humans for forever. Um, yes, I said it. Um, but uh, in the past, we used them poorly simply because we didn't understand the liquids that were inside of us. They used to call them the four humors. For those of you who are, uh, remember a little bit of your A&P history, you know, we used to think that we were made up of you know, four colored liquids, one yellow one, one green one, one uh, black one, and one red one. Those were called the four humors. Um, and so the red one with the blood. Um, and so when people were imbalanced, yes, that's the term that they used, um, they used to use leeches as a way to suck out some of that blood. Now, lo and behold, that was kind of silly, but what was really cool is that eventually uh, realized that these uh, leeches, the way that they can continuously feed without your blood clotting is that they had an anticoagulant. And so where we derive drugs like warfarin and things like that comes from these guys is the fact that they will consume blood without allowing it to clot because they prevent clotting. And so not only did we derive medical uh, treatments from that, but also the fact that we still use it to date. Sometimes in certain areas of the world, including the United States under the right conditions, um, we can use leeches um, as a way to dissolve clots. So when somebody has a fairly large hematoma, a very large giant bruise, more or less, we can actually attach these guys painlessly without causing much damage, and they will actually kind of cut through you and absorb the clot, kind of basically uh, liquefying it, and they'll consume it for you. So kind of a neat concept. All right, so that's where we're gonna conclude our uh, sets of worms. So we've hit our flatworms, our roundworms. In this case, this is the one version out of there called a segmented worm, which kind of resembles all the other worms behind there too.